Today on HTD, we're looking at American mythology and drinks that would have been popular when that mythology was born. Let's talk about it with a drink. Welcome to 1776 edition of How to Drink. I don't know what to say. I'm doing a bunch of drinks that are from the time and area around and immediately after the revolution. They're not going to be cocktails because really, just well, the, the cocktail hadn't yet been born. But they are mixed drinks, and I think they're going to be really fun and interesting. You're way before 1776. We're starting. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. That's a good point. Yeah, I don't. Um, some of these are from like the 1600s and stuff like that. So I want to make one I haven't made on the show in quite a while. It's called Flip. A Flip was a uh, a beverage. It was a heated ale beverage. Flip is the predecessor to the flip, which is a flip is a lot like a nog. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I have never been 100% clear on the difference between a nog and a flip. I think a nog has milk in it and a flip might not. I've been schooled on that. People have been like, that's not a nog, that's a flip. And I'm like, whatever, who cares? It's also called loggerhead. And that's because you make it with a red hot polka that would be sitting on the fire at the tavern. And I have a pair of these, and these are called loggerheads. They're also called flip irons, that kind of thing. And that's where the expression to be at loggerheads came from. You had too much flip, you got angry, you started fighting. Ah, they're at loggerheads again. It's a logger head. So the first thing we need to do is get a bowl and a whisk. You can make this drink with rum or brandy. I think rum is the way to go for me. If you think about kind of the rough scrabble kind of taverns down by the docks in New England, there was rum that they were drinking. Flip was for sort of like the rough sorts that you don't, you know, respectable society does not <laughs> hang out with. And rum, I gotta point out, was the most popular spirit in America in 1750, you know, whenever we started getting regular access to spirits. And I'm gonna look for a Jamaican rum for this. Bango, Smith and Cross, yeah. This is the one I want for this. It's high proof, it is Jamaican style rum. I'm gonna put an ounce and a half of rum into this bowl. Zippity doo dah. So now I need some brown sugar. You could also make this with a brown sugar syrup. It really doesn't matter in this case because watch what we're gonna do. That's about right, you know. You're talking about like an ounce and a half of syrup. That's maybe a little sweeter than it should be, but they weren't afraid of sweetness in their drinks at this time. People's taste for drinks has gotten less sweet over time. I think that the tastes have changed essentially because sugar became affordable and popular with regular people and then the aristocracy wanted to separate themselves from the regular people. Remember, spices used to be very popular and expensive as well. And then when they became affordable, it became like, you know, truly, if it was a good piece of meat, you wouldn't need to season it at all. Seasoning became a thing for the lower classes. Want to add an egg to this, but I will probably throw like an ounce of water in here as well, just because I didn't make brown sugar syrup and I want to make sure my brown sugar does properly dissolve. And a little bit of water is going to help that. And it's fine. If it was a syrup, it would have the water in it anyway, right? Now one whole egg. Yes, a whole egg. Remarkably not boiled. So often does my wife leave me with boiled eggs to use. Oh, thank God. All righty. And now I'm gonna whisk this together. Just kind of cream that as, you, as they say. Break up the egg, get the sugar dissolved, kind of make a uh, yummy, rummy batter. Yummy, rummy batter. <laughs> doesn't really sound right. The next thing we want to do is get ourselves a mug of ale. For what I'm about to do, I don't know that a glass mug is the right choice. This one is really heavy duty and I trust it reasonably well, but I do want you to see what's happening. And if I did this in the metal mug that I'm going to transfer it to in a minute, it would be boring to watch, it would be boring. Which one to use? We want a dark ale. The porter is for something else. So let's use the Chimay. Perez Trappist's Grand Reserve. This is probably a lot better than the ale and you'd find in some New England tavern around uh, 1680, you know? Oh, oh boy, I got it. That was weird, that wasn't shook up at all. I was sitting in a fridge all night. Did you drop that or something? Mm -mm. Weird. So now I'm gonna put this into my mug. Do a real straight down the bottom there, flatten it out because flat is what we're looking for with our beers. Last time I did this, I tried to use a little kitchen torch. That was a bad idea, it didn't work. So we're gonna use modern science. This is an electric um, coil. <laughs> I think this is for uh, heating up bolts to take off when they're seized. hot. We're going to slowly stream this in here. Oh boy. 
Might need to move it a little bit. <laughs> I happen to know that that toddy iron I have that was made by a blacksmith, I cannot get all the forge scale off of it. So every time I use it, there's like metal flakes. So I'm gonna strain it into one of these. And then, now I'm gonna roll this back and forth a little bit just to put a frothy head on it. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Hopefully I got all the metal out. There it is, a flip. Let's have a sip. It's very tasty. The egg provides a real interesting texture. It's creamy, it's mildly sweet. You can totally taste the strong Jamaican rum in there. I like it a lot. It's almost light, to be honest, because of the frothing and the egg. We've really kind of incorporated a lot of air into it. It kind of floats right down your throat, actually. It has a real mildly sweet, creamy texture. Mm. I love this. This is super drinkable. Makes me want to talk about Thanksgiving a little bit. Around this time of year, I think about Thanksgiving. I think we all know that Thanksgiving, the story you hear is bullshit, but I didn't know really specifically what kind of bullshit it was until I started looking into it. In fact, you know that it was a, a holiday that was invented by Lincoln to kind of like patch the national spirit up uh, during the Civil War to try to get people to remember their families and stuff like that. If you were raised up here in the Northeast, like I was, it's pretty easy <laughs> to forget or get it jumbled up in your schooling that pilgrims were far from the first Europeans to make any contact with the American Indians. There had been about a century of contact between Europe and the Americas at that point. Actually, when the pilgrims arrived in 1620, they were met by Wampanoags led by Massoit, several of whom already spoke English and had previously spent years in England. The Wampanoags made a treaty with the pilgrims for mutual protection before they ever got off of the boats, right? Because recently a flu or likewise, some kind of an epidemic had devastated the Wampanoags and they really needed allies, any allies they could get to support them in ongoing conflicts with the other tribal nations that were around them. It's like a year later, 1621, and the pilgrims are celebrating their first harvest with a rejoicing. It involves the firing of cannons for celebratory purposes and guns and doing target practice and their Wampanoag allies heard all this blam, 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 and then they showed up with an army to defend their new allies. And then the pilgrims saw this army and they got very touchy about it because there they are in, in Plymouth and there's like 90 minimum Wampanoag warriors at their gates saying, what the hell's going on over here? And it very nearly went wrong, but cooler heads must have prevailed. And they did in fact, or at least as near as I can find, spend the next three days having a pretty nice time together. But this was of course a brief and strained peace and frequently descended into brutal violence over the ensuing years. Finally boils over into something called King Philip's War. Philip was the name that Masoet's son, Metacom, had changed his name to. There was a tradition in the Wampanoag tribe to change your name during major life events and changes. And he thought that was a good time to change his name to Philip. And then people called him King Philip. This is a horrific nightmare war in which thousands of American Indians were killed or sold into slavery. After he was killed, Metacom was beheaded and his head remained mounted on a pole over Plymouth, Massachusetts for the next 25 years because we're so civilized. And that's the story of Thanksgiving. Let's move it along to Rattle Skull. I've never actually made this one, but it did seem like a good opportunity to bring out my wooden mug. Urgh. We're gonna do 12 ounces of porter. We're gonna use the Founders Porter. Founders make some good stuff, we like that. This is a really simple one. We're just gonna open our porter up and put this into the mug. Even doing a snake down the side. You guys use that term, snake down the side? You snake it down the side? I don't know if that's like a localism or not. I'm going to add an ounce and a half of rum or brandy. I'm gonna go again with my Smith and Cross, which is available at Curiata, drink.curiata.com. Ounce and a half there or thereabouts because it's not like they were using a jigger. Woo, right to the line. Now I need three quarters of an ounce of lime juice and I guess to fit it, I'm gonna have to take a sip off the top of this beer. <laughs> rough, rough job requirements. Okay, there we go. Get a little three quarter ounce of lime juice in there. Three quarters of an ounce of lime juice and some brown sugar. Not too much, not too little. A quarter of an ounce or half an ounce of brown sugar is, that's fine. Stir that up. The notes that I have call for brown sugar syrup, but I mean, you can dissolve brown sugar into a beer. I see no reason to add extra water to this. A little more beer, please. Sort of down a bit. Now I'm gonna hit it with some fresh nutmeg as Mr. Townsend's would do. That is rattle skull. Why is it called rattle skull? It's not because it would give you a headache and make your skull rattle. It was because you make it talk. Talk, he's, he's been drinking rattle skull all day and now he won't shut up. He's rattling his skull right on off. They knew a thing or two about dressing up a beer back then because that is freaking great. Just enough sweetness and lime juice to really balance and 
offset the porter. Let me try the porter on its own. Yeah, it's transformed. The porter is a very heavy, dark, creamy beer. I mean, it's porter and is porter different from a stout? My beer friends would tell me, but I think it's gotta be a fine line. When you put the spice, and the spice is so good, the nutmeg is so present in this, with the lime, which just brings brightness to it and transforms that porter and a little sweetness, which is not unwelcome in this, and then that rum, this is a lovely drink, very good. And actually, you know, when I imagine myself sitting by a crackling fire in a brick old tavern while it snows outside. Perhaps I've got a little plate of fried pork fat, maybe a little bit of cornmeal thing with some bits of bacon thrown in it, greasy foods. Now that I've had some rattle skull, let's rattle my skull and talk about the very reasons at the heart of our American revolution. One of which is that I've always heard that King George was a tyrant. Certainly no more than any other king of the age, and probably a hell of a lot less than any other king of the age. In the late 1750s, he let it be known in an essay that he was deeply opposed to the practice of slavery, thought it was an absolute abomination. In 1807, he signed a law abolishing the slave trade in England, didn't really outlaw slavery, it was an outlaw on the trade of slaves. England didn't outlaw slavery until 1833, but they managed to pull it off a hell of a lot faster than we did, and without so much as a shot fired in a civil war, freed some 700,000 slaves around the world at the stroke of a pen. George, uh, by all accounts that I could find that were unbiased, by all non-American accounts, I should say, and even a few American accounts, most of these notes, by the way, come from Smithsonian Magazine. George was the very model of an Enlightenment period monarch by all accounts. He was keen to stay within the bounds of the limits of his power. He would write essays about the importance of democracy and having a parliament that could challenge the power of an absolute monarch. These were like his... <laughs> his core principles that he built his identity around. He never once in his reign used his veto power on an act of parliament, which maybe he should have because that might have actually prevented the, uh, the revolution a little bit. Under his reign, the American colonies enjoyed one of, if not the freest lifestyles anywhere on earth. The press was uncensored. Despite what the Sons of Liberty would have you believe, soldiers were seldom seen anywhere. And the tax, that the average colonist paid was about a shilling a year. The average British citizen's taxes were about 26 shillings a year. Not to mention, of course, that that tax was instituted to pay for the cost of the French and Indian War, which evolved into the Seven Years' War, a war which was very likely started by none other than George Washington himself, because in 1753, he was put at the head of a group of British soldiers with an allied force of Six Nation Iroquois, Iroquois or Iroquois, with an allied force of Six Nations Iroquois, and sent on a diplomatic mission by the governor of Virginia to inform the French commanders of these new forts that France was building that were near, you know, English colonial borders, that you should go, you should get out of here. This stuff's gonna start popping off if you don't leave. Instead, Washington led a sneak attack against the envoy that he was supposed to meet, murdered them all in their beds. All of the accounts afterwards from the Iroquois witnesses and other witnesses said like, Washington fired the first shot. <laughs> um, just like stormed them in the middle of the night. You know, the most charitable accounting of that that I've read is that uh, he was a young and inexperienced commander. He was a little freaked out, a little trigger happy. Did he start the First World War? Yes, the Seven Years' War was, by a lot of accounts, the first world war. It was a huge global conflict between you know, France and England, the two superpowers of the age. And yeah, it was expensive, so to pay for it, they had to uh, raise some funds. There was the stamp tax, and there was the tea tax. Actually, what was one of the big issues was that there was already, prior to any of these taxes, a huge amount of smuggling going on in the colonies and they were like we're just gonna crack down a little bit on that shit that's already illegal and that really set some hair on fire not so much regular people's hair but the very very rich colonists were very concerned about their sources of income never ever 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 let somebody tell you that the founding fathers were just regular people washington and jefferson owned a bit more than the entire state of virginia between them that was it for Rattle Skull. I've rattled my skull right off. Let's move along to Philadelphia uh, Fish House Punch right after this. Okay, we're back. Let's make this Philadelphia Fish House Punch. This is a drink that David Wondrous, I think, has said it should be taught in elementary schools or something like that. It should be required 
teachings to learn how to make Philadelphia Fish House Punch, and now you are going to learn how to make it. I did take the recipe, the full recipe, and I cut it into a quarter. This is supposed to serve 18 to 20 people. It's an insanely large thing. Some people say that punch comes from the Indian word for five, which I think is punch, and it means it has to have five ingredients, which is lemon, sugar, nutmeg, and other things that are escaping me. Last I read, I don't think Dave Wondrich holds it that. I think he holds it the theory that it refers to the punch you develop from drinking it. I don't really know. All you need to know is that it's not a large format drink. I mean, it is a large format drink, but it's not just that. The first thing we're gonna do to make our Philadelphia Fish House Punch is we're gonna make some tea with PG Tips, England's number one tea. For a whole pot like this, I use three bags. Done. Some boiling water. Away she goes. One of these days we'll be done pouring this water. That's the only problem with a gooseneck is it's slow to pour. Great for some things, annoying for tea. So the other thing you have to make is oleosaccharum. Oleosaccharum is made by peeling lemons and macerating them in sugar. And I followed the instructions that I got with this recipe for Philadelphia Fish House Punch, which when scaled down by a, to a quarter, calls for a lemon peeled to a half a cup of sugar. I did two lemons to a cup of sugar. That's not the ratio I would use. The ratio I would normally use is two ounces of sugar to each fruit's worth of peel. And as a result, and I set this up last night, you'll see that my oleosaccharum is sort of, um, well, it's not really liquid and it probably should be, but that's okay. What it really means is that this sugar has extracted as much oil from those peels as it really can. And since there's still sugar, we know there's no more oil to extract. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use about half of this for our punch. And then maybe I'll take the peels out and maybe I won't. It's correct is all I really need you to understand. It's just not how I would normally make an oleosaccharum look. So we're gonna take about half of this and throw it into our bowl. You know, you can kind of wing it a little bit. Let's say that that's about right. And we can always add more if we don't like the way this punch comes out. So I've got my tea. I could measure this, but basically I'm gonna free, I was about to say free ball it, which is an awful thing to say. <laughs> I'm gonna free pour about a cup of tea in here, certainly enough to get our sugar and our lemon peels all nice and dissolved. The thing that's probably more appropriate would be something like this, a muddler, also known as a toddy stick at one time, or a pestle, so all dissolved now. The peels, leave them in, take them out, whatever. That's not what your normal lemon peel looks like, right? It's thoroughly transformed, it's very translucent, it's really been pretty much sucked dry by that sugar. Now I need a quarter cup of lemon juice for this ratio. Should be two ounces. Usually about a lemon to an ounce. So I'll slice two lemons. Two ounces of lemon juice. Now I need a cup, also known as eight ounces, of Jamaican rum. I have two with me today. I've got my Smith & Cross, which I love, and Appleton Estate. Let's mix them up. So I'll do four ounces of Appleton Estate. Killing the bottle. Yeah! And now I'm gonna do four ounces of my Smith & Cross. There you go. <laughs> it's getting strong in here. Now I need four ounces of cognac, and I've had to, to have this Hennessy XO, which is a stupid expensive bottle that I didn't pay for, but it is in keeping with the level of aristocracy associated with this kind of a badge. So let's, don't be ringing like a bell. And now I need one ounce of peach brandy. I am of the suspicion that at that time, at that place, they don't mean peach flavored, they mean eau de vie of peaches, which is what this is, or charred peach. I think we can get that available at Curiata, drink.curiata.com. Get a little piece of that action over here without a drink, so if you're trying to help out the show, stop it on curiata.com. But yeah, this is an eau de vie. This is a spirit made from a distillation of peaches as opposed to a neutral grain spirit that has been flavored with peaches, which is also called peach brandy. Complicated, I know. One ounce. Now, if you've been keeping track, this is a bowl of booze. Now we'll throw some ice cubes in there and give it a good stir. I got these big old blocks of ice. They're pretty appropriate. I mean, it would be cut like pond ice, right, for the time period, so. Just gonna put them in there. I'm not gonna crack them up because we don't necessarily want this to really dilute. I do have some leftover like ice shavings, some snow in this uh, kit of ice. And I don't think it would be inappropriate to kind of jumpstart our chilling and dilution by throwing it in there. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give it a good stir. And we can do a little meditation. Actually those ridges are there for a reason because we're gonna take our punch ladle, 
punch ladle, and then when you put it in there and you're not using it, it prevents it from obnoxiously swinging around. It stops it. So this is what a punch glass of the time would look like. They're small. They're, I think, only three or four ounces. And the idea behind them being small was to send you back to the punch bowl to see other people. But in truth, it wasn't like this was like a thing that you would put on the wall or something like that during the age of punch or on a sideboard. You put this in the middle of the table and everybody sat around it like it was a tiki drink, actually. Like it was a, a scorpion bowl or something. And so here we are, Philadelphia Fish House Punch. I haven't had this in years. I love this stuff. What a heavenly thing. I am surprised how strongly the peach comes through, which is crazy to me because my one complaint about that eau de vie is that it's not the strongest peach flavor. You know, if you compare it to like an artificial peach flavored de Kuiper peach brandy or whatever. But here it comes alive. The lemon, the sugar, it is wonderful. Oleosaccharum, because oleosaccharum means sweet oil, it gives it a silkier texture. It does change it just slightly, subtly. Boy, does it feature that rum. That rum is not hidden in there at all, but it's just for a short part of the evolution. It shows up and it says, hello, I'm rum. With all of its pot-stilled molasses -y, Jamaican funk, that immediately gives way to this very nice peach closeout, this sweet, but not overly sweet, delicious peach note. I will probably finish this bowl after we wrap on this drink for eight people. It's gonna be fun for all of us. <laughs> Mary, you ever hear that quote? Those who would give up essential liberty to secure a little safety deserve neither liberty or safety. Quoth Ben Franklin nevermore. Yes. yes you heard that quote. Oh yeah. So people get that quote wrong and that's one of my favorite, 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 favorite things about people getting quotes wrong. So when Ben Franklin wrote that down, he was writing on behalf of the Pennsylvania Colonial Assembly, the state Congress. He was writing to the governor of colonial Pennsylvania. The assembly had voted to enact a tax on the mega billionaires of their day, the Penn family, to pay for the defense of Pennsylvania during the Seven Years' War. The Penn family was heavily lobbying and coercing the governor to veto the act. Instead, they suggested, what if we pay a one-time lump sum in exchange for the assembly admitting that they in fact have no authority to tax us the pen? <laughs> what Ben Franklin is talking about there, the liberty that he's talking about there, is the liberty of the state to levy taxes, and the security he's talking about is the literal security of Pennsylvania. Soldiers, cannons, fortifications, supply lines, the makings of war and defense. I don't know, every time you hear that, it just always strikes me as a complete reversal of the intended meaning of that. And yeah, there is something to be said for the fact that, but that's what it means now. But it's also hard not to see the very, 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 very deep irony in quoting Ben Franklin to mean the exact opposite of his intentions. Well, my concern isn't that it's stuff we can use. My concern is that that bowl's gonna be gone and then we're gonna be If this bowl is gone, you're gonna drive me to the hospital. Yeah. If this bowl is empty, I'm in serious trouble. <laughs> That's how you make Philadelphia Fish House Punch. And up next, we're gonna make Ethan Allen's favorite drink, the Stone Fence. Ethan Allen, whom I've always, my whole life, thought was a furniture store. Stone Fence, right after this. <laughs> Boy, I gotta tell you, the Founding Fathers, they really knew how to throw a party because I am like fall down drunk at this point. I went to college with a really good friend of mine, Meredith too, a guy named Sean Dermond, a real historian. I haven't seen him in years, but he did do this thing on Twitter, you saw it, uh, where he, He's been working on this movie for years about Mrs. Benedict Arnold. And he's got this storyboard he made from like cut out three dimensional paper art. It is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, if you're watching Hollywood, please make my friend Sean's movie about Mrs. Benedict Arnold. It sounds awesome. He once told me, boy, you know, one thing people don't get right in history is that like the constitution, federalist papers, declaration of independence, drunk. The aristocracy, stinking drunk from morning till night. I feel about ready to write myself a constitution. Put it somewhere delicious. <laughs> mm, delicious bowl. <laughs> Moving on, we're gonna make Stone Fence now, which is Ethan Allen's favorite drink, or supposedly his favorite drink. I think he was famed 
for enjoying some stone fence before he went and raided Fort Ticonderoga, and I might be off on a few things there. Meredith, did you know that Ethan Allen was a person, not a furniture store? I did not know that. Me either! I didn't know that either. I knew of Ethan Allen as a commercial with a breathy voiced lady from the 80s as a place where you could find the most luxurious couches. It was the same voice as Call Telecharge Now. Cats! on Broadway. The air was thick with perfume. The seduction was complete. It changed us forever. British classics from Ethan Allen, where everyone's at home. So Ethan Allen, uh, I was unaware he was a real uh, member of the Founding Fathers or an important historical figure until a few years ago when I had to make a stone fence, which I have done on the show. I don't think I've ever made it quite correctly though. If a drink a pre-prohibition drink in America calls for cider. You need cider that has been fermented into alcohol. Only after prohibition did cloudy apple juice come to mean cider in America. Nobody grew apples prior to prohibition for any reason other than making cider. Johnny Appleseed, very famous uh, guy, actually existed. I forget his real name off the top of my head. Real dude. He would go around helping homesteaders set up apple orchards with his apple seeds. And very famously, he did not advocate for grafting. Now, we're getting into some pretty serious horticultural information here. But if you don't do grafting on your apple trees, you will not produce fruit that is suitable for eating. So Johnny Appleseed's apples were only suitable for drinking. And that was by design. Apple cider was the most popular fermented beverage basically up until, I think, Prohibition, or very nearly shortly before Prohibition, in America, other than rum, which was our most popular distilled beverage until it was overtaken by bourbon, or whiskey, whatever you prefer. Apple cider was king. Anywhere else on Earth, when they say apple cider, they know what you mean. You mean beer made from apples. This is a good episode. I'm telling you, and you, <laughs> flat out, whether you like it or not, this is a phenomenal episode of How to Drink. We want two ounces of rye, bourbon, rum, or brandy for a stone fence. I'm gonna bring out a bourbon that I like very much. This is the Weller 107. We're gonna drop two ounces of that right into my beer mug. And this is not a nice bourbon. This is a, like a nice bourbon. A cheaper bourbon would probably be fine here. Realistically, at this point, there's nothing left to do but add some cider to it. I'm using a Samuel Smith's organic apple cider. That's it. It's just rum brandy or whatever with some apple cider. And then a garnish of a sprig of mint. A couple sprigs of mint, because why not? Mm. And there we have a stone fence. Cheers. That's delicious. That's the best stone fence I've ever had. I think I've been making it wrong for years because I myself have fallen prey to making it with apple juice instead of apple cider because I'm an American and I forgot that that's not what apple cider means. This is very nice. This is apple-y, effervescent, bright flavor. It obviously has two ounces of strong 107 proof bourbon in it. The mint is huge in that. That whiff of mint nose is really good to offset the apples. Oh my God, it makes the cider come alive in this drink. I mean, if I just drink this from the bottle out of curiosity, not bad at all. I think it's like green apples. I didn't realize Sam Smith had such good cider. The one that I really like over here is JK, JK Scrumpy. I really like that cider. Otherwise, I really prefer ciders from the UK, imported ciders. I can't explain it, but like American ciders, heartburn, awful. Do I taste the bourbon? No. Yeah, I do. I get subtle caramel and peanuts flavor note that is, it's a little hard to detect. It's underneath the apples. The apples are the bright note. And I use those musical terms, high pitched instruments in a composition. You perceive them as being louder than lower pitched instruments, even though they might be hitting the same decibel level. And I think that's what kind of happens in drinks, like a high pitched, a brighter flavor, a more lemony, a more tart flavor 
just has an inherent loudness that is perceived as being larger than those bass notes that you find in the drink, which is from the apples and certainly from the bourbon, which has come down here. Much more James Earl Jones in its presentation. And I think that because of that, it makes it a little bit harder to detect things like the bourbon. Are you gonna put some mango in it or no? Oh, I forgot about that, thank you. Yeah, the recipe I found online calls for Angostura bitters, which I didn't include in my first build here because they didn't exist until 1824, but it, I love Angostura bitters in just about anything. So I figured let's give it a try. I mean, this drink was popular beyond the um, revolutionary period. So it does not surprise me to think that it evolved. Oh my God, what an addition to that drink. Yeah, put the bitters in there. <laughs> If Mr. Ethan Allen had access to 1824's Angostura bitters, he would have thrown them in there immediately. That adds an enormous amount of character to the drink. It imbues it with these baking spices. It takes this apple cider to which we've added bourbon. And bourbon has this brown sugar kind of sweetness to it. And it takes the whole thing and it makes it taste like a slightly drier version of an apple pie. What a delicious thing. The, uh, the, the mint isn't hurting at all. You may notice, dear viewer, that this drink used to be here and now it's here. And the reason for that is because we lost some footage. Because in my present condition, which is American founder drunk, asking if I'm actually recording is not stupid. But I am. There is a profundity to my drunkenness. A profundity indeed. There is in it truth and justice. In the American way. All of this stuff about American history was kind of new to me. I mean, I knew, broadly speaking, that like a lot of it's a myth, a lot of it's mythology, a lot of it is made up, not real. But I didn't really know the specifics of how that was true until I kind of researched this episode. Now I know, it wasn't true. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of HGD. I will see you soon with another episode. You should know that I'm on Twitter, Twitch, Patreon, TikTok, and Instagram, and that you will find that right here in the bank of places on the screen. Until next time, I'm Greg, this is HGD. Hey, I've been making this show forever. Why don't you check out one of these four episodes that is appearing before your very eyes. <laughs> And uh, I'll see you soon on another episode of HTD. Oh, a bit of punch. Don't mind if I do.